interesting fact about that, uh, that song. Uh, it was written by Augusta Stubb Lady, who was uh, uh, an opponent, a great opponent of the, of the Wesleys, who were contemporaries of him, and the Methodist movement. And one of the verses speaks of uh, him uh, not being able to be cleansed, atoned for by his tears that would forever flow. He would see all these Methodists sort of thinking that by their weeping and their uh, own mourning, they would uh, reach their own atonement. And he was opposing that when he wrote that verse. Uh, but having said that, let's go ahead and turn in our copies of God's Word to the book of Acts. Uh, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're only going to um, cover half of one verse. Uh, this is a, a text that is so rich that I was hoping actually to uh, go over all of, all of it from verses 37 through 41 on one uh, Sunday. But uh, last Sunday we only covered one verse. And then um, this, this evening we're going to be speaking uh, on uh, verse 38. And uh, we're going to get through, hopefully, part of verse 38. It's such a, a rich passage. So Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is the living word of God. And it says thus, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children. And for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Pray with me. Our great God, you are eternal. And your word is eternal. It's laid in your bosom from generation to generation. And you've given it to the sons of men so that they might have eternal life. We pray that you would open our ears to it. We pray that you would give us uh, to understand the text and to be transformed by it and to see the glory of Jesus Christ. We ask in his name. Amen. The year was 418 A.D. The occasion was the Council of Carthage. It was actually a sad occasion because in this council, a great man committed a grave error. That man was Aurelius Augustine, the most influential theologian of the Christian religion. And his error was that he presided over the council that first recognized infant baptism or pedo-baptism as an established institution of the church. Before, them, before that time, there had been some practice of infant baptism among Christians. But uh, until 418 AD, this Council of Carthage, no church canon had ever approved in writing of infant baptism. Carthage was the first, and this is what they wrote in that canon. It's our pleasure that whoever denies that newborn Christians ought to be baptized, let him be damned. Now, later, John Gill, the, the Baptist theologian, went on to argue that this same canon, this same belief in the baptism of infants would go on to become the pillar, the foundation of the papacy. It became the arm by which the Roman Catholic Church, the institution of the Antichrist, attempted its power grab, uh, tried to take over the whole world. How so? Well, if you baptized every child in a nation, you turn that nation into a nominally Christian nation. When you get a number of nominally Christian nations, you get Christendom. And so you call yourself the vicar of Christ on earth, and therefore you reign as a king over all the earth. You take over as Antichrist. So, infant baptism foundational for Roman Catholicism. It's the bedrock on which the Pope can have a worldwide reign over all the sons of men. But it has no basis in Scripture. 
None. That means that infant baptism has to die, as well as popery. And that is only going to ever happen when the Christian church allows Scripture to define baptism. When we come to the Bible to have the Bible tell us what baptism is. What's the requirement for baptism? What's the method by which persons are to be baptized? Where does it come from? What does it mean? Who gets to be baptized? The Bible has answers for all of these questions. And they're all embedded, believe it or not, in this important text that we just read, namely Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. This is actually one of the most abused passages in all of the New Testament. Uh, this text has been used to defend a wide number of errors from infant baptism or uh, also baptismal regeneration to salvation by works and denials of the doctrine of the Trinity. So this is a passage that you have to navigate very carefully lest you uh, shipwreck, make a shipwreck of your faith, lest you dash yourself against the rocks that are in it. So, so many have twisted this passage to their own destruction. But positively speaking, when you take a deep dive into this text, you come out with doctrinal gold, uh, especially concerning the sacrament of baptism. The, this passage has the, the defining characteristics of baptism. First of all, it, it tells you what the requirement for baptism is. If you ask the question, what do I need to do in order to qualify for baptism? The text says it right there immediately, and that is repentance. Repentance. The first part of verse 38 says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He's answering a question that was uh, proposed to him by the Jews, as we've seen in verse 37. We looked at last week, this group of people, uh, many of them had been in Jerusalem some months before for the Passover feast. And during that time, they first hailed Jesus as their coming Messiah, their coming King. And at the end of the week, they cried out for His crucifixion. But now they had come back to the city for the Feast of Pentecost, and they witnessed a miracle. Uh, they heard a supernatural sound. They heard a supernatural sound like a mighty rushing wind. You might remember that. And when they gathered to find, out, to find out what that sound was, they noticed that there were tongues of fire hovering over, over a group of about 120 Galileans. And those Galileans, they were all speaking in languages of the known world, clearly without ever having been taught those languages. So miraculously, they were speaking these languages. And then the Apostle Peter and the eleven behind them uh, behind him, took the podium or some elevated place, and they began to tell this crowd of people who were witnessing these miracles what it was that was going on. The same Jews who had, uh, to, uh, who, the same Jews, Jesus, whom they had crucified, uh, had risen from the grave, Peter said, and he went up to heaven in bodily form. And the miracles that these Jews were actually witnessing, they demonstrated that the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah were being fulfilled in this man, this Jesus of Nazareth. He had been, when he went up to heaven, and when he uh, arose from the grave and went up to heaven, that was God the Father exalting him to his right hand. And they also understood from Psalm 110, an ancient text that they all knew, that God had promised the Messiah that once he ascended, uh, the, one, the, once the Messiah had been exalted, he would crush the, his enemies underneath his feet. And so these men, uh, as we saw last week, they had crucified Jesus. And so who else could be his enemies but them? In other words, they're on the chopping block and they know it. They are the enemies that are facing fierce wrath. So verse 37, we saw it last time. It says that they were cut to the heart. That refers to immediate, sudden terror and remorse. They had woken up and they realized they're on the brink of destruction. They're at the edge of a cliff. And so they ask if there's any way out of this. Is there any mercy? Verse 37, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Is there a way out of this? Is there any mercy? Is there grace here? 
Can we somehow mitigate the consequences of what we've done because we've noticed that there is a great God who is now looking at us with great anger and He's exalted His Messiah and He's about to destroy His enemies. Is there mercy? And so verse 38 is the direct response to that. And what does Peter say here? He says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that word repent here in the Greek is metanoeo. It's a compound term, combination of meta, which uh, you might translate as against, and noeo, which means to think. So think against, or better yet, change your mind. Change your mind. Repentance is a change of mind. Now, when I say change of mind, I don't mean uh, the same thing that we mean by change of mind in this culture when we use that expression. Uh, when I use that expression, I've changed my mind, I tend to think uh, of a change in preference or a change of opinion. Uh, I wanted pepperoni pizza, and I've changed my mind. Now I want Hawaiian pizza. Uh, the, the New Testament, however, when it uses the word mind, it uses it in a different way. It isn't just a, tempor um, a temporary preference, a momentary preference, some temporary opinion. Not, no, the mind, rather, is actually put as the control center of the whole being. One lexicon says that the word comprises uh, alike all faculties of perceiving and understanding and those of feeling, judging, and determining. In other words, the mind is the soul at work. The mind is the soul operating. So a change of mind in the New Testament sense involves a move of the whole soul. The intellect, the soul is made up of intellect, will, affections. So the intellect, the thinking changes. Uh, the, the will, what you want changes. The affection, what you love changes. And so you might even say that it's a violent, if I may use that word, turning, a violent turning. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7 puts it this way. Let the wicked forsake his way, that means habits, actions, patterns of life, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So worldview, thought life, what you believe, and let him return, turn around to God. So repentance is a turning to God from anti-God actions and anti-God thoughts. Now some people today uh, read the word metanoia or metanoia, change of mind, uh, as you would understand a change of mind in this culture. They say that repentance is simply a matter of changing one's opinion about God. You used to be an atheist, now you say that uh, that Jesus is the way to God, or you m mentally assent to the fact that justification involves no working, but simply a receiving of the gift of life. But whether your life changes, such person would say, as a result of that belief, well, that's a different question altogether. That falls in the realm of sanctification. Uh, these are the people who justify the wicked. They're antinomian, against God's law, as if God's law were not for the Christian. They enable the, those who want to use grace as a cloak for evil. And the problem is that Peter would not have recognized that as the kind of repentance that he was talking about here. Notice he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ uh, is not Jesus' last name. We understand that. It's actually a title. And it means Messiah. Jesus, the anointed one, the Mashiach. And Jesus, again, he was uh, the man whom these very people had killed. So, so Peter is commanding these men to identify themselves with the same man that they themselves, along with the rest of their nation, once marked out as an imposter and a false phony. They needed to publicly repudiate something that they had done. And not only that, the means by which they were going to publicly repudiate what they did by killing Jesus, the means by which they were going to do that was baptism. Now, what do these people would have known? What would they have known about baptism? Baptism wasn't part of the 
their ancient tradition. So what would they have known about it? Well, we know John had started baptism, John the Baptist. And what would they have understood John the Baptist's baptism to be? Well, it was a baptism of repentance, we know. And we also know that he was out in the wilderness calling Israel to himself. And he was gathering the people, putting them through the waters, and identifying them by that as those who were awaiting the Messiah. This means that John's baptism signified that the religion of Judaism was corrupt, apostate, and useless. And therefore, to be baptized was to exit Judaism and become part of a new thing, a new covenant community that was being prepared for Messiah. And so this is uh, what Peter is asking. Peter is asking for more than just public identification with Jesus of Nazareth, which was difficult enough. He's asking these men to actually turn their back on their religion, their traditions, their religion of their fathers, uh, their own religions of their friends and their childhood. And they, by going bab undergoing baptism, were saying all of that is useless. This, of course, could have terrible consequences on them, and it would. In fact, John 9 speaks of the fact that whoever confessed Jesus would be already put out of the synagogue. And so this was uh, uh, something that could get you to lose your friendships, your livelihoods, your families, your houses, you name it. Uh, baptism uh, had, in this situation, at this moment in history, high, a high cost. And this is why we can talk about repentance as a, as a violent turning of the whole being. Peter is saying, look, do this about turn and undergo this ritual that is going to cost you everything. That's what repentance uh, is when we're talking about a repentance that is accord according to the will of God to use the language of Paul in 2 Corinthians 7. Th this is like uh, telling a, a, a gangbanger, do you want to be a Christian? Renounce your gang. You want to follow Jesus? Renounce your gang. They might kill you. Renounce it. Uh, there was one time that I, I, sat, I, I met a man who came to church, and um, he asked me to meet privately, and I sat across from him in a restaurant, and he went on to tell me uh, uh, his story, that for years, for years, he had given years to uh, sexual sin, and he had gone from one marriage to another, and he had suffered horrific consequences, all in the service of his lust. And he had been left empty because of all of that. And he was telling me across from that table, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I want to do this. And so, I, of course, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, and, and so I started to talk to him about how it is that we as a church could not only come alongside of him, but also his wife that he was married to. And when I began to talk about his wife, he stopped me. And he said, no, we're getting a divorce. I uh, decided to leave her, and she's already agreed to that. To that. And so I said, has she committed adultery? And he said, no. Does she want to be married to you? And he said, yes. And so uh, I said, look, if you're going to be part of this church, if you're going to walk with us, we are going to expect you to uphold your vows. Because this is what repentance is going to look like for you. This is the, the sin that you've com com kept committing. You've kept breaking your vows. So we're going to ask you if you're going to repent, uphold your vows. That man walked away sad and never came back. Because he had remorse for his sin. He felt really bad for his sins. He had a worldly sorrow. He hated the consequences of his sin. But he wasn't willing to turn away and bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And this is the kind of repentance that Peter is talking about here. Now, um, this is the kind of repentance that is, that is needed for baptism. Repent first and baptize, be baptized second. Now you ask, uh, whatever happened to, to faith in all of this? Because we tend to read the, the, the text of the apostles and when they went out preaching, it says that they were, were asking people repent and believe in the gospel. Um, 
or sometimes in the book of John especially, it always says believe. It doesn't even talk about repenting. So we ask, is there a contradiction here? One is saying repent, the other one is saying repent and believe, the other one is saying believe. So which one is it? Is there a contradiction? The answer is no, not at all. They're actually the same thing. Think about it. The repentance that he's talking about here is a repentance that is impossible to have without faith. Right? Th these people, they could not identify themselves publicly with Jesus Christ and regret having sinned against Him and repudiate what they did and break with their families and their friends in terms of religion and, and, and risk losing all things of this life if they not also believed that this was the Redeemer who was going to reward them eternally for it. So this is, you might say, a believing repentance, right? The, the, the faith is embedded into the repentance that they were to be carrying out. And in the same way, a saving faith is a, a repentant believing. A believing that involves turning away from the sin that you want to be saved from. Repentance and faith, they're actually not two separate things, but two distinct things. Two sides of one coin. And you have to have that, the whole coin, to enter into the waters of baptism. In other words, the requirement of baptism is a changed life. A changed life. Not that the minister is going to put a camera on, on, uh, on your shirt button and watch where you go and what you say. That's for God to do. But at the very least... For the minister to ask you this question, do you want to be baptized? How has Jesus Christ changed your life? How has it changed? What difference has he made in your life? Is there a new you? Or is there just a one you? Is there a new, an old self and a new self? If so, if there is a, an old self and a new self... Then baptism. If there is just a one self, no baptism. Repentance is the requirement, a changed life. Now let's look at the method. The method of baptism. How do we perform the ritual itself? The answer is actually hinted at in the very words of our text. It says, repent and each of you be baptized. Uh, the, the, the word to baptize is actually a transliteration of the Greek baptizo. And, and that word literally means to dip in or under. It denotes being covered entirely by liquid. We actually have classical Greek texts um, that use baptizo, baptizo for the sinking of ships. And actually the root of uh, baptizo is bapto, less intensive. And that's the word that John uh, uses in John 13, 26 to describe the dipping of the morsel that Jesus gave to Judas before Judas betrayed him. So he dipped it, bapto. It's also the same word that the rich man uses in hell when, he's, uh, when he asks that Lazarus be sent so that he could dip, bapto, his finger in water and cool off the rich man's tongue. So, so this is beyond dispute. Baptism means to dip, to dip in, to dip under. Now, the problem is that some have said yes, but the dipping is the dipping of the fingers in order to sprinkle. Clever. Uh, it's the, we're, we are talking about a dipping, but it's a dipping of the minister's fingers so that he could then sprinkle in baptism. The problem is that the person and the voice of the verb in our text work against that. They militate against that. Notice that the command was not in the first person, but in the second. And this is not talking about something that the minister was going to do, and neither was it an action that the penitent were to do themselves. The, the, the voice is, is, is the passive. So baptism is, is something that these people needed to have done to them. They were to be dipped. They, not the minister's fingers, they were to be immersed fully underwater. And that matches up perfectly with every description that you have of baptism in the New Testament. Let's look at a few of them. Matthew chapter 3, 
in verses 13 through 17. This is, of course, the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, 13. It says, then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be immersed by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be immersed by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, but Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. And after being immersed, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So you see how he comes out of the water, and then the Spirit comes. It's obviously a immersion full immersion why would he then why would he step into the jordan if he's gonna get sprinkled in the jordan that would make no sense let's go and uh to john chapter 3 and read verse 22 john 3 22 and 23 notice this one after these things jesus and his disciples came into the land of judea and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So this is what I want to show you here that he was baptizing in uh, Enon which by the way meant springs and it says that the, he was baptizing there because there was much water there. So if you had to sprinkle people, why would you go to a place where you needed a lot of water? If, sprinkle, if sprinkling is the way to baptize, then all you needed was a few drops. But John went to where there, were a, a much, there was much water. Uh, let's do one more. Ch Acts chapter 8. This is the account of the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and again... Uh, these are every text where baptism is described in some detail. The practice, the method of baptism is immersion. Uh, Acts chapter 8 verse 36. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. So notice there is a going down and a coming up into water. So there is no doubt about it. Every single New Testament instance of baptism involves not sprinkling, not aspersion, but immersion. Uh, so you have the lexical and the, gram the grammatical information. Be baptized. That proves that baptism is by immersion. Then you also have the recorded instances of the New Testament that prove the same thing. And here's another thing. Baptism symbolizes something, right? And the thing that it symbolizes is best symbolized by immersion, right? Because baptism is a reenactment of what? of the burial and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Um, I hardly have to take you to many passages. I'll just give you one. Romans 6, uh, chapter 6. Romans 6, verses 4 and 5. It says, Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, buried, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So there you have it, right? The, the thing that baptism is, sim is symbolizing is a union with Jesus Christ who, was, who, was, who died, who was buried, 
and then was raised up by God in newness of life. And so we are symbolizing that in being immersed into the waters and being brought back up. So you have grammatical and lexical information proving this. You have New Testament examples proving immersion. You have the reality that baptism symbolizes proving immersion. And then here's one more. The history of the church. Now this one's surprising, right? The history of the church, really. Wouldn't you say that for centuries the church has been baptizing people by sprinkling? Isn't this one of the, 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 isn't this one of the things that we're actually trying to get away from after so long, so much tradition? And to that I say, yes, for, century, for centuries that has been the case. But when you look at the history of the church, you'll notice that baptism by sprinkling did not begin until the 14th century, the 1300s. And it was actually in the 1300s where you had a rise of papal corruption, papal consolidation of power. It was not a great time of purity in the church. And it was the, the, the schoolmen, the great theologians of the church who were trying to help the papacy, who came up with the idea and defended the idea of sprinkling. And so for 1,300 years, Christians were satisfied with the practice of immersion. So as, as much as it is true that for uh, the past 700 years we've been sprinkling people, uh, it is also true that for 1,300, we immerse them. So, the history of the church proves immersion is the right way to baptize. Or to baptize. I'm going to give you one last defining characteristic of baptism itself. So, so we've looked at uh, the method of baptism, which is immersion. And we've looked at the requirement of baptism, which is repentance. Let's look at uh, one more, and that is it, its source or its authority, the authority behind baptism. Again, um, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The expression in the name of here denotes authority. Authority. They were to be baptized by the authority of Jesus. That means that Peter was not asking the believers here to be baptized. Uh, uh, or, 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 or that means uh, that Peter was not asking the believers here to be baptized in the name of the Son to the exclusion of the Father and the Spirit. He wasn't uh, providing uh, the formula for baptism as Matthew did in Matthew 28, 19. As if Matthew had said, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And Luke is sort of coming back and contradicting that. And saying, be baptized only in the name of Jesus. That is what some people actually believe. Uh, but we reject that. Because otherwise you're saying that the Bible is con contradicting itself. And God doesn't lie. God cannot lie. God cannot deny himself. So there is no contradiction. So you say, well, why then, Peter, why is he using uh, this expression, be baptized in the name of Jesus? The answer is simple. He's actually emphasizing... Um, the, the, he's emphasizing the second person of the Godhead here, not to the exclusion of the other two, but he's emphasizing the second person because it was Jesus whom these people explicitly had rejected and killed. So this is a matter of repentance. These men needed to acknowledge publicly that Jesus of Nazareth, that man, was indeed the Messiah as he had claimed to be and the only way to God. And that means that baptism itself had come from Jesus Christ. He was the source of the right which symbolized your union with God. Because oneness with God came through Jesus Christ. So, Jesus Christ being the source of baptism and, and the, the, the means by which we are united to God, He therefore gets to define what baptism is. He gets to regulate it. In fact, um, let's look at jo uh, 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 John chapter 4. This is a very interesting passage. John chapter 4. And, and it's, a, it's a passage that shows that whenever an individual is being baptized, it isn't so much the minister who's doing it, but Jesus himself, which means he's the authority behind baptism. He decides what baptism is. Notice, uh, 
John 4, 1. Therefore, when the, Lord, the, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, and so forth and so on. You can finish the verse on your own. But, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that Jesus was not baptizing anybody himself. But, and his disciples were the ones doing the work but it says that Jesus was, was baptizing nonetheless. Verse 1. Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. But Jesus was not baptizing, but rather his disciples were. So the point here is that Jesus is the source of baptism. He's the authority behind baptism. When a minister of the gospel baptizes, that is actually Jesus doing it himself through the minister of the gospel. This is a divine ordinance. It comes from God Himself. It comes from Jesus Himself. It is not regulated by the Pope, nor by the theologians, nor by tradition, nor by convenience. No, Jesus gets to set the terms. And this is what the Church of Jesus Christ needs to understand and go back to. This is for Him to set the terms. He lays out what are the requirements of baptism, as we've seen. He lays out what, are, what is the method in which baptism is to be carried out. He sets the meaning of baptism, what it means, and what are its effects, and who are the subjects, who gets to be baptized. He's the authority. He's the authority. And baptism was meant for the growth and the well-being of Jesus' kingdom, not to facilitate the power grab of the Antichrist. So, the church has to come back to real biblical baptism. Now, next time, we're going to consider the meaning of baptism, the effects, the subjects, who gets to be baptized precisely. But we've run out of time. Um, so you'll have to come back next week. It is to be continued. This is part one, part A of our message on baptism. So pray with me. Our great God, we thank you that you have given us uh, such a clear revelation. We are the ones who make it obscure and um, things like tradition um, give us, uh, make us to be blinded by uh, something that's right in front of our, our eyes. We, we just, we ask you that you would help us to submit ourselves to, to the authority of your word and to follow you regardless of our, the consequences. We, we've seen uh, how the first church, as we'll see, that they they got they did get baptized. They they did produce fruits in keeping with repentance, and it it was costly to them, and they had to break with traditions, and uh, they had to suffer consequences and persecution. Uh, but that did not stop them because they saw Jesus as the one who is worth all things, giving up all, all things for, for. He's the pearl of great price. And uh, we found the pearl of great price, and we rejoice in that. Uh, we glory in our Lord Jesus. And so we pray that he would be honored in our lives. In his name, amen.